contractors are wary of the latest proposed rule giving DOD access to their IT systems. It's part of an effort to improve cybersecurity with incident reporting and information sharing. Another rule would impose new requirements on contractors' unclassified systems. Reaction now from the Executive Vice President for Policy at the Professional Services Council, Stephanie Castro. And Stephanie, these rules are just coming out one after another. They are FAR rules, which means they will affect procurements and DOD really getting deep into the knickers of contractors' systems. That's exactly right, Tom, and thanks again for having me. We've seen a flurry of cyber-related and information system-related proposed rules coming out. And these two rules that you highlighted, you know, we had a lengthy time to comment on them. And I would highlight also that it's not just the Department of Defense. These are FAR Council rules, so they're applicable government-wide. And so it's not just DOD. It is the whole of government. And in some cases, as a previous guest on your show had discussed, it could give Department of Homeland Security and the FBI access to your system and what the government is calling full access, which means if there's an incident, go into your system and investigate, including parts of your contractor system that are not dedicated to government work. So it really, in our view, is ripe for uh, correction and amendment in terms of when we go into final rulemaking, because it is really overstepping on the government's part. Sounds like you'd have to designate someone from the government to have administrative privileges on your system. (laughs) It does sound a bit like that. The incident reporting piece is something that we've discussed at length with both our member companies, as well as with the government, about, you know, what is an appropriate time frame once you have a cyber incursion, uh, how do you report it, et cetera, and to whom. These two rules do go a bit far in terms of not offering uh, live actions to to government contractors. If you have a government person with admin privileges or not going into your system and something happens as a result of that access, we believe federal contractors should be not held liable for that. I can see the speeches now. We have all these unelected sysadmins coming in and (laughs) messing with our (laughs) systems. Uh, Anyway, we we won't go there on that one. So what have you proposed specifically to modify it should they decide to take your comments in? Well, for the first case that you mentioned, which is on cyber threat and incident reporting and information sharing, we've talked a lot about definitional changes. What does full access mean? And we'd really like to see the government limit it to contractor systems that are performing government work, not the whole enterprise system. We're also talking a bit about protection of what is called government data or government-related data. You know, A lot of companies have trade secrets, have pricing models, have sensitive information on their systems. And one of the rules does go in to say, you know, if it is on a system that performs government work, that is government related data. That's an issue in terms of intellectual property. And it's an issue in terms of privacy. Yeah, it sounds like it's an issue in terms of law, even. You know, there are existing clauses out there that do protect intellectual property and the contractor's right to own the data that it creates. We believe that the government is trying to get at the use of third-party data, meaning the government holds a license for another company's information, and they're lending it to the contractor performing the work. Therefore, it should have protections because the government is facilitating access to that data. We don't argue about that, but we do think that if you are a contractor and you are creating data and you have access to the data that you yourself own, it shouldn't automatically be transferred to the government. And anyway, if this is all in a cybersecurity related context, maybe they should have a rule or the rule should limit the government access simply to your logs for analysis to understand what might have happened in an incident. I think that's exactly right. And to the extent that an incident is of concern to the contractor itself, you know, we don't want to presume that the contractor doesn't care when there's been a cyber incursion. They care very, very deeply about this. So understanding what happened and doing the forensics on it and then preventing similar incursions in the future is critical. And so what we believe and we've said in our comments is that, you know, the government needs to talk to the industrial partners about intellectual property, trade secrets, litigation liabilities, and claims against the federal government in the cyber realm. And as I mentioned, there's been a flurry of cyber-related proposed rules, and we do think it's wise of the government to try to harmonize those. Again, the devil is in the details, and if you make a definition in one proposed rule in one way and it has a different definition in another proposed rule, there's a lot of cracks through which you could fall. Well, they're certainly flooding the zone. We're speaking with Stephanie Castro, Executive Vice President for Policy at the Professional Services Council. And the other one rule that you're talking about, too, is the standardizing cybersecurity requirements for unclassified federal information systems would impose 
rules on what your systems should look like, how they're configured, you've got some issues there too. It's very similar to what we have to the other rule. And I don't know if this was by design, but the comments were due on both on the same day. So these are very, very fresh in my mind as our comments are trying to mutually reinforce each other. And part of it is, again, comes down to definitions. How do they define full access? How do they define government data and government related data? We are concerned that if they try to put this clause or this set of clauses in every contract, including things for commercial off the shelf items, it's a little bit, again, flooding the zone. I like that phrase that you use, Tom, because there are certain contracts where this kind of information or this kind of rule should be applied and others where it just doesn't make sense. And one area where some of our members highlighted a real concern is if you are a company that has several government contracts and you have one security incident on your system, what are they going to investigate? Which was considered the federal information system and how do they dive into that? You know, it's a concern that many members had about the onerous reporting requirement and do they have to report for every single contract? Are they all considered federal information systems? And so, again, the devil is in the details. We're working through this and we hope to see some of these changes in the final rule. And one more thing I wanted to ask you about is that the member companies are scratching their heads and turning to the council for what to expect in the upcoming presidential election. I can just hear them now. Stephanie, what's going to happen if it's Trump or Biden? You know, and so it's going to be Trump or Biden from the looks of it. So never have we been able to narrow it down so early, it seems. You know, Tom, that's exactly the point that I make to member companies. We've had several companies come and say, all right, so look in your crystal ball and see what's going to happen in terms of contract spend and and what the budgets are going to look like. And historically, PSC has looked at presidential elections closer to the actual general election. But it seems that the primary system has already picked winners and losers here, at least so far. It seems that the candidates are predetermined. And so we can look into the crystal ball a little bit. You know, President Biden has signed out more than 130 executive orders. Some of them will be rescinded under a different president if that happens. So we're trying to do a quick analysis of what policy issues might stick and what might go by the wayside under a potential Republican president. And so we're looking at that. We're also analyzing the transition from 2016 to 2017 to see what happened to budget requests and the contract spending. We're also going way back into, well, it's not technically way back to the origin of our country, but it is back to the Obama administration, right, with the two terms of under a Democratic president and what happened with contract spending there. You know, it is, I hate to use the word unprecedented because it's been hyped up over the last four years. Everything seems to be unprecedented. But we do have an opportunity here to do some analysis about presidential politics earlier in the cycle than we have in the past. Well, things may not be unprecedented right now, but they've never happened before. So we can put it that way. Yeah, I think that's true. I think also we talked about the flurry of cyber related activities. There have been a lot of proposed rules coming out in recent months, and that's not unusual in this part of a presidential term because everything that was put in place in the first year is finally hitting rulemaking now. And I would mention that in the first six weeks here in 2024, PSC has commented on eight proposed rules or other opportunities to comment. And that is probably twice the pace that we usually go. So eight rules in six weeks means that we're all going to be very, very busy at PSC going forward. Stephanie Castro is Executive Vice President for Policy at the Professional Services Council. As always, thanks so much. Thanks, Tom. And we'll post this interview at federalnewsnetwork.com slash Federal Drive. Hear the Federal Drive on demand. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.